Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Dino Fest at Home. This is a week-long festival celebrating dinosaurs, their prehistoric past, and the science that brings their world back to life. Brought to you by the Natural History Museum of LA County. This program is being live streamed to the NHM YouTube channel and will be available for you to enjoy and share with others on the Dino Fest at Home playlist. We'll add that link into the chat. My name is Michelle Barbosa. I am a science educator, a professor here at colleges in Southern California, and the newest co-host of PBS Eons. That's PBS Paleontology web series. I'd also like to learn a bit more about you guys, our viewers. So tell us, who's watching with you? If you're on Zoom, you will see a poll popping up on your screen. For younger viewers, I'd like to remind you to get an adult or a parent to help you out to answer this poll. The questions you'll be seeing is who's watching with you? Is it just me, other adult enthusiasts and me, child dino enthusiasts and me, a whole herd of adult and dino dino enthusiasts or just dino loving students? While you guys fill out that poll, I'd like to let you know that while you see the wonderful museum behind me, you may be able to tell this is a virtual background and that is why I'm not wearing a mask. I'm actually safe at home in my own balcony. I would like to say as well, while you are finishing taking that one question poll, that we also have some helpers from our education department at the museum, Christina, Marisol, and Rocio. They'll be behind the scenes and helping you guys out in the chat. So if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them into the chat for us. Our helpers will take note of all those questions and we'll get to you in the last portion of this paleo chat. Before we jump into our interpretation, I also want you to know that our program is interpreted in Spanish via Zoom. So for those of you watching on YouTube, you can click Spanish captions by clicking the little gear button at the bottom right hand of your screen. And you can see I am sharing my screen right now. This is an example of what it'll look like if you are on Zoom. So you'll see a button for interpretation on the bottom right of your screen. You can click on the button and choose your language. And if you want the original audio to be muted so you only hear Spanish, you choose interpretation button again and select mute original audio. If you didn't catch any of that, that's okay. We will add instructions in the chat box as well. Okay, so I just wanna let you know that while you can see us, we cannot see you. So again, to answer your questions, we'll be using that chat function in the bottom. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers for this morning. So with us, we have Dr. Luis Chiape. He is the Senior Vice President of Research and Collections and the Gretchen Augustin Director of the Dinosaur Institute. Dr. Chiape oversees the research programs and vast collections at the Natural History Museum of LA County. He studies the evolution of dinosaurs, particularly their evolutionary connection with birds. And our other guest is Dr. Nathan Smith. He's the Associate Curator of the Dinosaur Institute here at NHMLA. Dr. Nathan Smith supervises the Dinosaur Institute staff and conducts research in support of our programs here at the museum. His research focuses on the origins and early evolution of dinosaurs. So everyone, welcome our guests. Good morning. All right. So. I'm going to start off by talking for about 20 minutes, and then at the last end of our program, I will be answering all of your questions. So if you have questions while we were talking together, again, drop them in that chat for us. But first, I think I'd like to ask our guests, what exactly does a dinosaur paleontologist do? Luis, can you start us off? Absolutely. First, let me tell you that this is a working space, and just a few minutes ago, we had some of our preparators working here on fossils in our fossil lab on the fourth floor of the Natural History Museum, but now they're all gone for this show. So I'm gonna remove my mask and be safe uh, since I'm alone. So let me um, answer your question. Um, paleontologists do many things. Here at the museum, Nate and I and our staff of paleontologists, we provide oversight of our collections we grow our collections through field work. We conduct research Nate, on early dinosaurs, myself more on late dinosaurs and birds. Birds are dinosaurs. And we also mentor 
uh, a number of uh, younger um, scientists, whether they are you know, aspiring scientists like high schoolers or college students or graduate students or postdocs, that means PhD level professionals that are starting to learn about um, how to conduct research. Now, at the museum, this is Dino Institute, at the museum, uh, we have dozens of researchers conducting all sorts of uh, uh, research from anthropology and history through all the oologies of uh, biology, uh, as well as geology and paleontology. And there's dozens of researchers include our curators, the collection managers, community science um, researchers. So there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes here at the museum. Awesome. Nate, do you have anything to add to that about what a dinosaur paleontologist does? Yeah, I think Luis put it pretty well, which is that we have to wear a lot of different hats. And, and here at the museum, um, we do a little bit of everything. You know, one of our main priorities is kind of collecting and caring for specimens uh, and objects. And then we, we use those basically to both conduct uh, new research and basically expand knowledge, but also for education and science communication, um, which is kind of a fundamental part of, of science. So you can think of our museum and museums in general as kind of like a, a library for the whole earth. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, I, I think- I hammer on an important uh, point. We use our collection not only for research, but of course for a, a wide range of public programs, including exhibits. I was the curator of the Dino Hall if you've seen the Dino Hall, you know, I was in charge of, you know, the, exactly, including collecting like Thomas, the one that you have there on, on your side. Um, and, uh, and Nate was a curator of a recent exhibition that we had on Antarctic dinosaurs. So that's part of our, our ongoing responsibilities. Yeah, I think when people think about museums, they imagine what my virtual background looks like, the really cool exhibits that you get to see when you visit. But you guys are in the museum and it doesn't look like that. You're talking about collections and field work. Can you talk a little bit more about what a museum does and what's this whole behind the scenes collections that you're talking about? Um, Luis, maybe you could start by talking a little bit about that prep lab that you're in. Sure, this, this is a very big space. This is one of two fossil prep labs that we have here at NHM. And we also have one at the museum um, in the Tarpets, um, the Page Museum. Uh, what we do here or at the Tarpets is pretty much the same in the sense that the fossils are coming to this lab. They're coming dirty, they're coming from the field, they're, they're surrounded by rock and we have uh, our paleontological conservators here who, are, who clean them and stabilize them so they are um, stable enough to be um, kept in our collections, handled by researchers when they do the research or mounted in a mount like the ones you have behind you. So that's, that's, a, that's a primary function of a space like this. Awesome. And Nate, um, if we have these collections, how do we decide whether the fossils that get cleaned stay behind the scenes or come out for everyone to see? Right, well, one of the most important things to understand about natural history museums, and especially a big one like ours, is that you're seeing just a tiny, tiny fraction of our collections out on display. You know, that's not uh, the entirety of, of what we've got and what we have to care for. Um, at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, we have over 35 million specimens and objects. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to kind of prepare those, catalog those, curate those, conserve those, study those. Um, and we don't just kind of put them away in a drawer and let it get dusty and never touch them again. We're, we're bringing them out all the time for special exhibits, for educational programming, uh, and as people are conducting more research on the different specimens and objects in our collection. And you know, those, those uh, fossils and, and objects and, and specimens in general, 35 million are kept in our three museums, the Natural History Museum here in Expo Park, the Page Museum at the Tarpets, Hancock Park, and uh, the Hart Ranch in, in Newhall. And on top of that, we have four warehouses filled with collections. 
Yeah, so for those of you who are watching and don't know, the Page Museum, which is also known as the La Brea Tar Pits, and the Hart Museum, and the LA Natural History Museum of LA County are all part of one big museum family. So our researchers and our resources go to all three of those museums. Now, we've been talking a little bit also about field work, which is really cool. For anyone that doesn't know, field work means when you go out into the desert or Antarctica or wherever it may be to look for dinosaur bones and fossils. So I'd like to know where do a lot of these dinosaur fossils that we have on display or in our collections come from? Luis, maybe you could start us off. They come from everywhere. I mean, we, over the years, we have done a lot of field work here in the US and that's how we grow our collection. And, but we also have done a lot of field work internationally Nate works in Antarctica, but he's also worked before in Argentina and other places. I've worked in China, Pakistan, and of course, Argentina, my home country. And uh, I have projects currently in Brazil. And of course, here in the US, we have projects in New Mexico, in Utah. We've had them in Montana. The two T-Rexes that are on your sites are both from Montana. Um, so that's, you know, we, we work, uh, I mean, um, across the globe and essentially what paleontologists do when they go to the field, they survey the land, they, they find a tip of bone as they walk over the badlands and that tip of bone may lead to a whole skeleton or may lead to nothing, but that's part of the, the exploratory work that we do when we're out in the field. Wow, it sounds like dinosaurs are all over the world. And you just mentioned that Nate found dinosaurs in Antarctica. So if anyone visited the Natural History Museum in the last year, they might have seen our temporary special exhibit about Antarctic dinos. But just in case they didn't, Nate, could you give us a refresher about how or why there's dinosaurs down in the snow? Well, in, in part, it's because dinosaurs were very successful. They, they radiated out and basically were in all corners of the globe um, and existed for hundreds of millions of years and still exist today as birds. Uh, why we find them in Antarctica is because Antarctica was a very, very different place back 190 million years ago in the early Jurassic, right? It was connected to all the Southern continents. It was a little bit further North and it had a, a climate that's very different than the climate of Antarctica today that allowed these animals to thrive. That makes sense. Um, can we talk a little bit about what kind of tools you use when you're out in the field? Uh, Luis, maybe you could start um, us off again. We use all sorts of tools, but in general, nothing too sophisticated, to be very honest, you know? I mean, in terms of the tools that we use for collecting fossils, we use hammers and chisels and, and shovels and dental picks when we want to be very delicate. And sometimes, uh, you know, jackhammers or rock saws. Uh, in general, that's those are the you know the the diversity. Of, of course, brushes, as you've seen in Jurassic Park and other movies. Uh, but we also use drones or GPS um, trackers to locate the sites and, and mark the sites and all sorts of things that we use, not necessarily to collect the fossils mostly to record where they are and find them. Nate, maybe- so that's just as important. Yeah, I, think, I think that's one fun way to kind of think about it in terms of uh, you know, the, the life of the fossil coming out of the ground is that it goes from really low tech, you know, we might be going at these things with just hammers and chisels to once we've got it back here in the lab, then we start bringing in the high tech and we might be CT scanning the fossils or uh, laser surface scanning them, um, recording information about them and, and putting them into statistical and computer programs to run. So it's a nice contract. Why, why would you CT scan a fossil? What does that mean? So um, that's kind of like a souped up version of a CAT scan. If anybody out there has ever been in a CAT scanner, I have back in the day. And it's essentially just a way to, to peer inside and, under, and learn about the internal anatomy of a fossil. The only other way we'd be able to do that would be to cut it in half and we collections managers and paleontologists and curators, we don't, we don't like cutting up our fossils unless we really have to. So that technology has kind of opened up um, kind of a, a whole new subdiscipline and, and new access to understanding about the biology of these animals that we didn't have in the past. 
Wow. So it sounds like a lot takes from finding a dinosaur way out somewhere in the world to getting it prepared, to putting it maybe on display or ready for research. About how long could that take? Luis, maybe you could answer this one. Yeah, it, it takes a long, a very long time. Really, to collect the fossil is usually the easiest if you want. The bottleneck of many museums is after the field. And many museums have warehouses filled with jackets or blocks with fossils that have not been prepared because you know the work that takes place in places like this is very, very time consuming. Like for example, Thomas, which you have on your, on your site there, um, it took us three summers, give and take uh, a month, four weeks uh, uh, every summer to collect the entire skeleton. That's about maybe 70% or so complete of that animal. Uh, but it took us another um, seven years or so to prepare the skeleton and then to mount it. Currently, we're working on another dinosaur that we've nicknamed Natalie. It's a, a Diplodocus type of dinosaur from the late Jurassic, 150 million year old dinosaur. It's coming from Utah. We've been working at that quarry, the Natalie quarry, for um, over a decade. In, in, in our preparers here have been working for that time, 10 years, getting the bones ready. We expect to mount this uh, in our new um, welcome center by 2023. So by the end of the, that time, it, it, it's going to be, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 year process. So. Wow, a lot of work going into this. Um, Nate, you just talked about dinosaurs in Antarctica, but could we find dinosaurs or fossils here in LA in our own backyards? Yeah, that's one of the great things about, um, you know, paleontology is that Fossils are distributed across the globe, and California is not a super famous place for dinosaur fossils since most of California was underwater during the Mesozoic. But we do have the California state dinosaur, Augustina lophus, which you can see in a poster over Luis's right shoulder there um, that's on display in our dinosaur hall. Um, but if you're willing to kind of expand your search beyond just dinosaurs, we have incredible paleontological resources um, in Southern California. You can go over to Palos Verdes or, of course, the Tar Pits, which is really the only active dig site um, in a big urban area, uh, which is kind of a unique thing throughout the entire world. So Southern California is rotten with great paleontological finds, um, and it's the kind of thing that you can come across out in your schoolyard or even on a hike. And you know, while we say correctly that big dinosaurs like Triceratops or Diplodocus or T-Rex um, are not at the tar pits, the fact is that there are hundreds of avian dinosaurs at the tar pits uh, that are being collected every day. And you have all sorts of other fossil birds that are found throughout the LA Basin. So, you know, yes, you know, the, the, the rocks that are here in the LA Basin do not contain or seem to contain the remains of the large dinosaurs, but certainly they contain the remains of avian dinosaurs and many other kinds of fossils. Totally. And I think something we can talk about as well is while you can find fossils in the ground, you guys just told us that there's a whole bunch of fossils in the museum collections. And from what I understand, people make discoveries even within those collections. Luis, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how that could happen. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, trips to our warehouses or our collection cabinets are mini versions of uh, you know, field projects because you could open a drawer and find something that no one really paid much attention for decades, perhaps. Uh, so there, there, there are many more fossils in, in, in museums across the globe uh, than the capacity of paleontologists to study them. So they're all the time uh, research projects and in, in new um, research uh, um, results that are coming from people examining fossils that have been in a museum collection for decades. One of our examples um, that I like to mention all the time is the one about Polly, the, uh, the pregnant plesiosaur, which is currently 
on display at the Dino um, Hall. This plesiosaur is the only um, evidence that we have, the only specimen of a pregnant um, marine reptile, plesiosaur in this case, not, there are other pregnant marine reptiles, but the only pregnant plesiosaur in the world. And it, it stayed in, in, in a warehouse uh, in, at our museum for maybe three decades until um, I was able to put it together working through uh, with a team of the, um, of the Dino Hall. And then we published a paper with an expert on plesiosaurs. Uh, but that's an example of something that had been sleeping in the guts of the museum for a long time. That and is I think so there's a cool. really important case to be made for the, you know, why natural history collections are so important um, that we take care of these specimens for a long period of time, because it's not just somebody coming along with fresh eyes to look at a specimen, but it might be um, fresh questions and new technologies, you know, whether that's CT scanning an old specimen, or if you've got some avian dinosaur feathers in your collection from the 1900s, well, whoever collected them couldn't have predicted that someone more recently let, might come along and sample isotopes from them to understand uh, ocean chemistry uh, or look at eggshells to understand kind of um, pre-agricultural uh, levels of DDT and things like that. So it's a really important role that we play in our communities. Collections are time capsules and, you know, particularly now as we face the consequences of climate change, we, we find ourselves going back to our collections to determine the baselines that existed before, you know, the situation that we're facing today. In those, those, those uh, uh, forays into the collection allows us to make more accurate predictions about what's going on now and what could happen in the future. Yeah, it sounds like there's definitely still discoveries to be made, whether you want to become a field paleontologist or a researcher or come prepare in the lab. There's many different ways we can get involved and be the next dinosaur discoverer. On that note, since it is getting towards the end of our chat, I'm going to start looking at some of the questions that have been asked by our guests. So let's start off with Mrs. Ann's class from Mountain View Montessori Charter School in Victorville. They want to know, what is the newest or most recent dinosaur species to have been discovered? <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe Nate can help here, but you know, there are dozens of new dinosaur species that are named and described on an annual basis. So um, I really cannot tell you uh, one, I mean, but Nate actually has relatively recently describe one, right? Well, if we were talking about our Antarctic dinosaurs, um, yeah, only a little over 10 years back, we described a new species of long-necked Antarctic dinosaur, kind of similar to the ones that Luis is wearing on his shirt. And this was named Glacialosaurus, and we featured it in our Antarctic dinosaurs exhibit. Um, we also have some um, specimens that we collected from our last trip down there. Uh, that are probably going to be end up being new species of Antarctic dinosaur. Um, this is a picture of the skull of one of those animals and a diorama from that exhibit. So yeah, as Luis notes, we're finding new species all the time. So you might not hear about them um, except for the really big uh, finds that get into the press, um, but we're constantly finding new specimens and describing new species in the paleontological literature. So that's just a reminder to everybody out there that the work isn't done yet and there's plenty of room for discovery. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, Gabriela wants to know, how can you become part of the Dinosaur Institute or become a volunteer at the museum? Well, you go through our volunteer office process. Of course, uh, currently because of the pandemic, uh, volunteers are um, not working at the museum is only limited to staff, um, but hopefully as of next year, we'll be able to not only bring back our wonderful volunteers, but also take more. So I would recommend that you uh, reach out to the volunteer office of the museum and, uh, and enroll. I mean, we'd love to have more volunteers. Um, the minimum age for uh, volunteering at the museum is 16. 
do you need to have a lot of experience with dinosaurs and fossils to become a volunteer at our museum? You don't. Um, you know, often we interview our volunteers and, and we train them and, and we determine what they um, can do and, and they maybe not. I mean, I think you don't need to have any uh, experience. You need to be, you know, willing to learn. And it's important to give a quick shout out here that even though our volunteer programs um, aren't active as the museum is shut down, we have a really amazing community science program. And that's another way that people can join and contribute to the creation of new knowledge um, and really pitch in the scientific process at NHM. And for that, you, all you need is your smartphone and take pictures through a platform called iNaturalist and then you know help us document the nature in LA and around the And as Luis mentioned, not all dinosaurs are gone. You can start observing birds right now and practice training your eye and become a junior scientist. Exactly. Now, I have a question for Nate from Cecilia who wants to know, how are cold weather dinosaurs different than warm weather dinosaurs? Oh, that's a good question, Cecilia. So we know that the, the climate was a little cooler than at the equator when these Antarctic dinosaurs were around, but there weren't polar ice caps. They weren't kind of experiencing the real extremes that we see in Antarctica today. Um, however, that's one of the things that we're constantly looking for when we study these new finds to see if there were any unique adaptations that some of these animals might have. Uh, there was a really cool find that just came out, not about dinosaurs, but about some of these small mammal relatives, uh, the Lystrosaurs, that lived before the, um, the dinosaurs were around in Antarctica, that was studying kind of their growth and suggested that their growth might have slowed down a little bit during those long polar winters compared to some of their lower latitude relatives. So that's kind of a, a real cool, if you forgive the pun, tip of the iceberg um, to set up some more research into these animals. So stay tuned. Um, Luis, Jonah wants to know, are birds dinosaurs? And if so, then why did some of the dinosaurs go extinct? Great question. Thanks, John. Uh, yes, uh, birds are dinosaurs. The birds evolved from some um, small raptor-like uh, type of dinosaur. They have a very long evolutionary history throughout the age of dinosaurs with many different types of birds becoming extinct and only at about maybe 60, between 60 and 70 million years ago, they radiated into all the different kinds of, of birds that we see today. Now, at the same time, towards the end of the Mesozoic era, the age of the dinosaurs, that mass extinction that marked the end of this era, the large dinosaurs that were alive at the time, like T-Rex or Triceratops, to mention a couple, became extinct as a result of, you know, the, the global uh, changes that were taking uh, place at the time. Uh, there was also climate change at the time. And as you probably know, there's also the impact of a very large asteroid that hit the Earth. Speaking of T-Rex, Ariel wants to know, who named Thomas? Um, my team uh, did that. And we did that because uh, we named it after the person who made the discovery. Very cool. Um, also, speaking of dinosaurs on display, do the dinosaur bones ever fall down during an earthquake? Uh, no. Freya is asking this question. That's right. Good. Very good question. Of course, as you can imagine, the mounds here have been engineered to sustain an earthquake. I mean, obviously, to sustain an earthquake um, that is not going to flatten this entire city. Um, so, and, you know, we've had since 2011 a uh, number of, you know, small quakes, uh, you know, and uh, nothing has happened. They have not lost, not even a single tooth. Whew. Okay, Margarita wants to know, and I believe this question is for you, Luis, if we could see the bone that is behind you in the prep lab. 
of course. I'm not sure if you're I'm, able I'm to move gonna, your laptop. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can. Let me, let me, let me do this. Let me see if I can move this. And I'm gonna go here, looking at the little the camera. Can you see? It? Can you see it better now? Yes, All we right. can. That is the femur or thigh bone of a sauropod. It's actually Natalie a diplodocus. So it's one of the um, one of the bones that our preparators here are working on, and it's going to be included in the Natalie mount. Awesome. Okay, so I think we're just going to do one last question since we're getting to the end of our time. So let me go ahead and check out this questions right here. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so last question from Mike, and I think both of you guys can answer this one is how do you guys know a dinosaur's name? How do we know a dinosaur's name? I, I think the question is, there are new dinosaurs and they're getting new names. So how do we know what that dinosaur's I name is going to be? I try and tackle that, and Luis can maybe add a, a less nerdy definition. But there's, there's kind of two things we do when we're studying these animals when we pull them out, is that we're, we're looking for features of their anatomy that tell us what they're related to, right? If I find something with opposable thumbs, I know it, it's probably a primate. If it has hair, it's probably a mammal. If I find um, a leg bone like this that has the top of it turned into the side, I know it's probably a dinosaur, right? That tells me what group it belongs to. And then to tell whether it's a unique species, we're looking for unique features, features that are uh, of the bones that are only found in that specimen or that group of specimens that tell us this belongs as its own species. That's right. So when you, when you realize that after you've done all your comparisons with collections across the world that your new find doesn't fit any of the known uh, dinosaurs out there, you name a new dinosaur, not, you know, with a name like Thomas. Those are nicknames. You name it with a, what is a, a two-part uh, name like Tyrannosaurus rex, for example. But many times the fossils that you find are actually they belong to species that are already known. And it's through the comparative work that Nate mentioned that you could say, oh, this is actually Diplodocus. It's not a new species. Awesome. And if you'll humor me for one last question from Morgan. Morgan wants to know, how do you become a paleontologist? And maybe if we could just get two short answers from you guys and we'll let everyone go for the day. Yeah, I'd say you start by having a curiosity about the natural world. The great thing about paleontology is that it's integrative and interdisciplinary. You can like chemistry or anatomy or ecology or geology or computer science, any of those things, and there's going to be a pathway into paleontology for you. And getting connected to a museum like this, perhaps through the volunteer program, is a very good first step. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for your time and talking to us today. Um, and to all of our guests out there, I'd like to say that thank you for joining us as well. There's more to come still with DinoFest at Home programming, even though our chat is over. So at 11.30 a.m. today, our live animal programs is going to present Survivors of the Dinosaur Age. So you'll get to meet a live vertebrate animal. That's an animal with a backbone like us. And then tomorrow, Friday, September 25th, will be the last day of Dino Fest at home. So we'll also have these programs available on the NHM YouTube channel to enjoy and share with others. You can just go to our Dino Fest at home playlist, which again will be in our chat as a link. So thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of Dino Fest week.